Grace, mercy, and peace to you, brothers and sisters, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Kindergarten. It's a word that we hear, that we use often, especially here at Mount Lebanon, where we have so many little children, where we have a, a two-year kindergarten program for four-year-olds and five-year-olds as a part of our school. We use the word often, kindergarten. But do you know what it actually means? It's actually a word that we borrowed from the German language, and it consists really of two words, kinder, which means child, and garten, which you maybe can guess, means garden. So a kindergarten is, in a sense, a, a garden of children. And it gets that name from the man who invented it, a man named Friedrich Frebel, who started the first kindergarten in Germany in the year of 1840. Up until that point, education was something that didn't start until a child was six or seven years old, and, and Friedrich wanted to help lead these young children into that. He called it kindergarten because that aligned with his vision statement for early childhood education, which was this. Children are like tiny little flowers. They are varied and need care, but each is beautiful alone and glorious when seen in the company of its peers. Yesterday, I had the chance to talk with some of the parents of the children in our school, and yes, some of the parents of our kindergartners too, as we gathered together for a parent event here at church to talk about growth mindset. We had a special guest come in to present to us on growth mindset, how to instill in children this growth mentality that they can do it, they can continue to grow. And it's an important conversation because we want our children to grow. We want them to grow in so many different ways. We talked about how we want them to grow socially and emotionally. We want them to grow physically and academically. And because they're not just our children, but they're also God's children, we want those children to grow spiritually. And so does God. God wants his children to grow Spiritually, that's our first take-home note for today. And not just the little children, not just the four- and the five-year-olds. God wants all of his children to grow in the Spirit, to grow in their faith. And he communicates that to us in so many different places in his word. But we see it especially in these two passages that we have today in front of us. Two passages from two different letters that the Apostle Peter wrote to the Christian church. So we give our attention first to a lesson from 1 Peter chapter 2. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. And then from 2 Peter chapter 3, Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. This is the word of our God. Our God who wants his children to grow, who makes it very plain to us as he says through his apostle Peter, grow. So as we listen to the word of God and as we have this conversation as we're doing over the last two weeks and today and the next two weeks as well, this conversation about the DNA of our congregation and we're asking ourselves the questions, who are we? What kind of a church are we? What kind of a church do we want to be? Part of our answer to those questions has to be, we want to be a growing church. And I don't mean by that growing in the sense that we have, I don't know, 140 people here this morning, and next week we want to have 160 people, and the week after that, 200. We want to be a growing church in that sense too, don't get me wrong. 
We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. But we want to be a growing church in the sense that we want to be a church, a place, a family within which individuals can grow. We want to be a kindergarten, a spiritual garden for God's children within which they can continue to grow in their Lord and Savior, Jesus. And so growing is one of the five strands of our DNA here at Mount Lebanon. So what does it look like for a Christian to grow? If we were to define that term spiritual growth, what kind of definition would we give it? Those are maybe more difficult questions than they have first seen. And I think throughout our nation, throughout even Christianity in America, you would find a lot of people who would give an answer that, that might not be hitting it 100% on the money. Because when we think about spiritual growth, there is a tendency for us to think of it as a question of how do I become a better Christian? What are the things that I need to do in order to show that I am growing in my relationship with God and in my walk of faith. And become a better Christian might be added onto that checklist of things that we have. There, there's a danger to us if we look at spiritual growth from that kind of a mindset. It's taking all of the burden of that growth and it's putting it right on us, on our own shoulders. And then when there is spiritual growth, when we see someone who, who has a maturity in their faith, what it does is it puts into our minds the thought that this is because of their hard work and their dedication. It comes from their self-control in choosing to do what is right and in choosing not to do what is wrong. And so the credit for that growth goes to them. But when we look into God's Word, into the passages where He talks to us about growing, that's not what we see. Let's look back to that first passage we had from 1 Peter. And it does start off with a list, a list of things that he wants us to turn away from, rid yourselves of malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. But then it isn't until the second verse where he uses that word grow, and here's what he says there. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Peter sets aside the illustration of a plant growing in the ground for an even more familiar, even more dear illustration of a little baby who needs its mother's milk to grow. Friends, the milk that we as Christians need to grow is Jesus. And Jesus brings himself to us in the Word. He gives himself to us through the gospel, the gospel we find in his word and in his holy sacraments. Our second passage from 2 Peter said, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. So once again, there isn't a checklist of all the things that we need to do or to not do. He boils it down simply to this, growing for a Christian comes from knowing Jesus and his grace, his love for you. What Peter is sharing with us here is something that he learned from Jesus himself. When Peter was with Jesus the night that he was betrayed and arrested and handed over to be crucified, Jesus had, had a lengthy conversation with his disciples that night. This is a night, you probably remember, where Peter showed that he had a lot of room for growing. And on that night, before Peter abandoned Jesus and went running off to hide, Jesus had had a conversation with them, one that you're probably familiar with. We find it in John chapter 15. Jesus, speaking to his disciples, said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So growing as a Christian 
and producing fruit as one prerequisite and one alone, or to borrow from the language of Jesus that we heard in our gospel lesson, there is one thing needed when it comes to growing. We have to be in Jesus. We have to be in his word. In the Bible translation we use here at Mount Lebanon, the New International Version, uses that word remain. Jesus said, if you remain in me and I in you, Other translations that you may have heard use other words like dwell or abide or live. So when we say we have to be in Jesus, remain in him, we're saying we dwell in Jesus. We live in his word. So what does that look like to live in God's word, to have his word living in you? Can we say fairly that we live here in this church at Mount Lebanon? Heather and I probably are the closest. We live right over here through a couple of doors around the corner. We're here often, right? We're here regularly, once or or twice, or for some of you, three or four times a week. We're here at Mount Lebanon. But if those three or four hours a week are the only time that we are with Jesus in his word, can we fairly say that we're dwelling in him, that we are living in him? No, I think if we want to be dwelling in Jesus, then we want our time with him in his word, in addition to the time we spent here, to flow over more into the other hours of those 168 hours a week that he gives us. We want to be spending time with him. And so if you're interested in figuring out more how to do that, you are in luck because since we at Mount Lebanon are committed to being a growing church. We have a lot of opportunities to share with you. As you're heading out of the sanctuary today, you're going to walk past our welcome table on the left, and on that welcome table, there's a stack of calendars. You can pick one up, and you can see throughout the month all of the different opportunities that you have here to get together with other brothers and sisters in Christ, to sit down and talk about and discuss Jesus and his word. Some of those opportunities are our Connect Group Bible Studies, which just started up again this last week. If you want to learn more about those, you can grab The Way to Joy, which is also available there on that back table. Right on the second page, there's a nice blurb about our Connect Groups that tells you about them, gives you a link for where you can sign up to be a part of one. These Connect Groups are are groups of believers from our church here getting together and discussing the Word of God that we share right here in our Sunday sermon so that we can let it sink in a little deeper, so we can draw from it and apply it to our lives even better so that we can grow through Jesus and his word. We have groups that meet in person, groups that meet online. We have a group for teens that meets back here in the office before church on Sunday. There's donuts. We've got something for everybody. Maybe right now you're thinking, I'd like to also grow in my personal devotion life. I'd like to grow in being able to devote some time each and every day on my own at home to sitting like Mary did at the feet of Jesus and hearing what he has to say. And if that's the case, then we have resources for you there to talk to Pastor Borman or to myself about getting one of these SOAP journals. SOAP is, simply put, a a method. Uh, It's super simple and it's super effective to help you get more out of your personal time in the Bible. SOAP stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. So we're reading the Scriptures. We're observing what it has to teach us. We're we're looking at how it applies to our life and then saying a prayer about it. And in fact, tonight from 4 until 6 p.m., we have our SOAP Review and Refresh meeting, so an opportunity to gather here in the community room just to share in some of the joys and challenges of that personal life of devotion to God's word. And yes, because we care about physical growth too, there will be food. So I hope you can join us. As Christians, we want to grow. And here at Mount Lebanon, we're committed to growing. So what happens when we grow? First of all, I want to warn you, you're going to experience some growing pains. Because the ironic thing when it comes to growing spiritually 
is that it is not about becoming more and more independent. The ironic thing when it comes to spiritual wellness is that what it means is figuring out more and more that it is not the healthy and well who need a doctor, but the sick. And oh, how sick we are. As we grow in our faith, we're going to be growing in a realization of just how totally helpless and how completely dependent on Jesus we are. How much our sins have sickened our hearts, those sins with which we've wounded our God, with which we've spat in his face or turned our back on him again and again and again. So this growth, at first, is going to hurt as it plunges us down into the depths of this pit of God's law. But the deeper and darker we go down into the pit, the more joy, the more relief, the more wonder there will be. As our Savior reaches down into that pit to grab hold of us and pull us out and with the words of his gospel assure us that all of those sins have been washed away. That there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Martin Luther once said that until God makes a man nothing, he can make nothing out of him. So that's what God does. He takes us, and with his law, he he works through the Holy Spirit in our hearts to strip everything away, anything that we might have had that we thought, here's this to my credit, this that I can set before God, it all gets stripped away. And when he's made us nothing, he pours out his love into our lives with that sweet promise of the gospel. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus. That's what this conversation about growing is really all about. It comes down to the question, are you, is your soul, are you resting in Jesus, rejoicing in that promise of the removal of all condemnation, or are you not? Because when it comes to Jesus, brothers or sisters, you're either in or you're out. And I'm not going to leave you there today. I'm not going to let you walk out of here contemplating, am I in or am I out? I'm going to share with you the truth of what God's Word says, that by God's merciful grace, you are in. He picked you up like a branch that was broken off and lying there on its own dead, unable to grow, unable to produce anything. He picked you up and he has breathed into you through water and the word, the breath of life. He made you alive. And then like a master gardener grafting that branch into a vine, he brought you into Jesus so that, yes, you are in Jesus. So let's encourage each other to remain in him, to live in him, to dwell in him, to be in Jesus, to be in his word, to think about his word, to apply his word and appropriate it to every moment of our waking lives. So that from morning till evening, day after day, we live in Christ and he lives in us. If you remain in me and I in you, Jesus says, you will bear much fruit. Not might bear, not should or ought to bear, just will. Remain in me and I in you, Jesus promises, you will grow. I have a book here that I got just this last week. I was happy it got dropped off by the Amazon guy half an hour before our Thursday service, so I was able to share it with them too, but... I hadn't read the entire thing, and I haven't yet either. It was recommended to me by a friend. It's a book called Every Moment Holy, and it's filled with uh, what it calls liturgies to use throughout the day. Uh, We have a liturgy that we're following this morning that has hymns and prayers and lessons and our message to, to focus us here on worshiping our God. And so that's what these are 
less hymns, more prayers, internal dialogue for our minds, for the different mundane acts of every day. It has a liturgy for folding the laundry, a liturgy for preparing a meal, a separate liturgy for preparing a meal in a hurry. And then there are not one, but two liturgies for changing diapers. And because of where I'm at in my life right now, looking forward to that so very much, I wanted to share a liturgy for changing diapers too with you. For there are many diapers that must be changed. Lord, what a mess we sometimes make of our lives. What a tragic comedy is even our most sincere attempt to earn righteousness on our own. I am no more able to render myself holy than this child of mine is to keep himself unsoiled. I'm as dependent upon your grace and your righteousness, Lord Jesus, to justify me and make me clean as this child of mine is dependent upon me to wash this filth away from its skin and to wrap him again in soft and freshly laundered garments. Let me not grow frustrated by the constant repetition of this necessary act on behalf of my child, but let me rather let the daily doing of this be a reminder to me of the constant cleansing and covering of my own sin that I, as helpless as this baby and far more often in need, enjoy in the act of mercies of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I want to grow in Jesus with you. I want to become so saturated, so filled to the rim with the love and joy of our Savior Jesus that it simply overflows, that we can meet life as it confronts us moment by moment and in every single moment, even in the mundane, the simple, the everyday things, we're able to meet that moment first remembering Jesus and his love for us. And then by singing out from our hearts with praise to God. And the peace of your Savior Jesus that surpasses understanding will guard you, your hearts and your minds in him until life everlasting. Amen.